Good morning, church family. Is anybody ready to worship Jesus today? Uh, come on. Put those hands together in the room, church. Come on, come on. Woo! Oh, we come to bless the name of the Lord today. There's power in the name of Jesus, y'all. Hey! Here we go. Everybody say.
So if you can scan the QR code or text VIP to the number on the screen, we just want to connect with you and get a chance to know you. That's right. Yeah. And on your way out today, as you're, if you're a VIP, when you get out in the lobby, there's an area that's the VIP area. You yeah. can't miss it. And we want you to stop there, meet our team. We'd love to just welcome you, kind of get to know you as you're getting to know us, and yeah. also give an opportunity to give you a gift to just say thank you for being here today. Absolutely. And one of the things that we always say here is that we want you to give us at least three, three tries, tries to get right. the full, vibrant experience. So can we give it yeah. up for all of our VIPs in the room today? Yeah. Well, believe it or not, we are already starting to step toward the holiday 
season. And so we're getting ready for all of the things that come with that. But one of the things here that we are very excited about is this year for Christmas, we are doing something called Giving Hope. Yes. And this is an opportunity, yeah. It's an opportunity for us as a church yeah. to love on families here in our community in the Golden Triangle uh, kind of area. Yeah. And because of people like you, your generosity, partnering with us, volunteering, all of that, we're able to provide a great Christmas for hundreds of children, yeah. over a hundred families this year. And we want you to be a part of that. There's a QR code that's on the screen. You can scan that to register today to be a part of Giving Hope yes. or on your way out today, stop at our Giving Hope banner. Our team would love to get you connected, answer your questions yeah. so that we can all give hope in this holiday season. Yeah, absolutely. And church, thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for being a generous church. Uh, all of what you see today and all of what you will see is because of your generosity. So there's four ways to give you can see on the screen and we just wanna thank you. Yeah, thank you for partnering with us. That's right, and as always, we believe in being a generous church. Absolutely. On your way out today, there's giving containers at the exit as well. Yes. We can all stand back together. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that already we feel your presence in this place. God, it's our prayer today that we would not leave the way that we walked in this door. God, that we would be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is your time, God, and we thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. And everyone said, let's worship together. God, you're so good.
grateful to be in the presence of God this morning. I'm going to ask that again. I'm not, I don't think you're awake yet. I said, are you glad to be in the presence of the King of Kings and the, the great physicians in the house, the healers in the house, the deliverers in the house, our saviors in the house. Come on, let's act like it. Give God some glory in here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. It is an honor to see everyone today. And isn't it just something after a long week just to be in the presence of God, to worship, to be together with church family? Amen? Amen. Why don't you do me a favor? You can just grab your seat really quickly. Thank you, Jesus. I brought my wife with me up here today. Isn't she wonderful? World famous legendary Lena Elizabeth Ricky Paul I'm just kidding hey listen want to take a moment you've been watching the news like all of us have uh, the, this has been insane uh, what's going on with these hurricanes and flooding all over over five states have been affected and I said this last week but I want to remind everybody that we are all a part of of advancing the kingdom of God in this church. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And many people have asked, what are we doing? How can we help? And I said this last week, and I just want to reinforce it uh, this week, that we partner with a great outreach of missions, one of our main missions called Convoy of Hope. And they have been incredible of what they're doing in the world today. And they just have the infrastructure, the manpower, the systems, the connections, the network to be able to do on a large scale that what we can't do uh, locally. And so we're all for sending trucks and water, we'll do our part, but this particular ministry is just was on the ground so fast. Many times Convoy of Hope beats the Red Cross and FEMA and everybody else there. And I wanna tell you this, if you are a financial contributor, you tithe to this church, you are making a difference because we partner with them. They're already there doing what they can do in Florida and North Carolina. So just some of the pounds of product distributed, they've been able to uh, give away 2.3 million pounds, which is like toiletries, water, uh, food, things like that. They've been able to serve 123,000 people in the last just few weeks, served 44 communi communities, six different states, and loads and loads of, of trucks are still going and relief is being uh, is happening and i think like many of you we all got friends in florida or we go down for vacation and 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 our heart goes out to them two hurricanes in just a few days and, and uh, can we just thank god for for number one thank god for convoy of hope we're very grateful for what they're doing but can we just take a moment i asked my wife to come up and to pray and if you'll just join us in a moment to pray for all these families affected by what's going on all over our nation. How many of you know it's just crazy right now? I mean, we got to get to this election. We got stuff going on. Every time you turn on the news, it's just crazy. We need Jesus. Can I get a big amen somebody? So why don't we just take a moment and, and pray if you're online, join us right now. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your organizations like Convoy of Hope and for Convoy of Hope. We thank you that that you've empowered them, that the mission that you have given them to go and reach out to those who are experiencing devastation. God, I pray for all the individuals who, and families who are affected Jesus. by these hurricanes, these, yeah. this tr these tragic things that have been happening. God, I pray that, that, that each individual will have their needs met, God, the basic human necessities that we all need. Yes, God, I pray Jesus. that every person will be reached, those sure. that are in hard-to-reach places, God. I pray that you would give Convoy of Hope and others who are in those areas that are devastated by the, the hurricanes, God. I pray that you would empower those the people who are on the ground. Give them the strength, God. I pray for the resources, the continued resources to, to reach out to these people in need, God, who have experienced so much loss. God, I ask you that, that you would empower them. I pray that you would allow people to experience the hope of Jesus yeah. even after something so tragic. And I thank you, God, that you make all things work together for the good. Yes. For those yes. who love you. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All thanks. 
All things work together. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to say this, while, while I got you up here, you should tell all the ladies to come here tonight. Tell them. We I have, mean, yell at them. We lady. have Just... ladies' night. If you haven't signed up, is it in the lobby? The, the... registration. They can yeah. register. Not now. Well, there was a queue right there. Oh, QR code's over here. They can, they can register on the QR code. But here's what's cool about ladies' night. You can show up in person. Uh, we're accepting walk-ups. So if you want to come, there's going to be refreshments. There's going to be worship. Pastor Kayla Dobbs will yes. be here tonight. So and you will love her. She's, She's wonderful. wonderful. It's going to be great. And there's a big giveaway tonight. Yes, is it in the lobby? Did is you it, see it? Is it? There is a massage chair given yeah. away tonight, so ladies. So all you have to do is register and you are put in for the drawing to win that. Yes. How easy. So get here tonight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Ladies need a night. And you guys are going to have a great time. It's going to be refreshments. It's going to be, it's going to be good. All right? Do me a favor. Will you stand with us all over the room from front to back? I know you're like, come on, Pastor Ethan. Please let us sit down. We have... Uh, with us a very special guest. Last week we began a series called Hope After Church Hurt. And I think this series uh, was is, is so needed in the day and time that we live. And he wrote a book called Hope After Church Hurt. Uh, this content is being pulled from this and I wanna encourage you to go back in the lobby today and, and buy one of these. They're gonna be available. There's a limited amount, so please grab, grab one for somebody that's been to hurt in the church context. I think it will help them. Uh, and so we got a month full of this series I'm really excited about, but I asked the author, Pastor Joe Dobbins, who's a good friend of mine, and to be a part of our weekend. And he said, yes, he loves you guys. I know you love him. He's a pastor of a great church with many services and a bunch of campuses. I can't keep it all straight. I don't know what he's doing. I just know he's doing it big. Can I get a big amen? Do me a favor, welcome Pastor Joe Dobbins. Stay on your feet, stay on your feet. It is awesome to be back at Vibrant today. This, I told him in the back, this is this is one of my favorite churches in the entire U.S. that I get to come to. So I'm just honored to be with you today. Um, kind of hoping Kayla wins that massage chair. A little conflicted about that actually because we already have five kids and I know where massages lead to, so I don't know. But... Um, Nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, it is great to be here, and um, and I want you to grab your Bible. We're gonna we're gonna open up together. Grab your Bible, turn to First uh, Samuel chapter twenty-eight. While you're doing that, um, I just want to take a minute and and just tell you something you don't know. Um, I was in Dallas just a couple weeks ago uh, for a meeting of the the um, most influential spirit-filled leaders in the United States. Because, um, and the reason we were together is because um, we believe that God wants to pour out a fresh on the United States of America. How many of you believe that we need a move of God in our country, right? Well, one of the people that was in that room was very, very, very invitation only was your pastor. And that is because he is seen as one of the most influential spirit-filled leaders in the United States. And so I just wanted to tell you, not only do you recognize the gifts you have, but um, around the nation, they recognize what a gift Pastor Ethan and Lena are. So thank you so much to be here today. Um, anybody can be here. You could have anybody in the world, and, and that I get to do this means a lot. I honor both of you. Um, I, I'm, I am excited about this new book and the healing that it could be maybe for your life. God's kind of breathed on it, and it's uh, it made one bestseller list, and I'm hearing from people all over the place about how uh, they're healing. Here's what I believe. We don't just need churches that reach the lost. We need churches that heal the found. And there are a lot of people who love Jesus, but they're struggling to come back in a place like this. And so this book is meant, this series is meant to help um, just bring some healing to some of you who are still present, but your heart's hard, and also to those who aren't present. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do with the book. I'm going to sign books after uh, this service. I'd love to meet you. Um, but I'm going to ask this. We've got a special deal where actually it's cheaper to buy two books than just one book. And that's because I want you to buy a book and then I want you to give it to someone. Every single person in this room right now knows someone who loves Jesus but is not a part of a church because of something that happened in a church. 
And the reason you that their name just popped up on your heart is because that's the Holy Spirit nudging you to help be a part of the miracle that restores them to the body of Christ. So um, we'll, we'll do that at the end of service, but I, I, I wanna encourage you to do that. I, I'm gonna preach a message today uh, out of the book. It's actually, I think, the hurt of all hurts, to be honest with you. Um, and it came from this idea that um, we, were, we went to the movies, and I, I like going to the movies. I like comedy. I like, you know, uh, action. I, I like about any movie except for horror movies. I just, if you like scary movies, this has never been my thing. Um, as a matter of fact, a couple years ago, Sawyer and I were on the Haunted Mansion at Disney, which is just like this little cartoon ride. He's laughing his head off. He's five years old. And I'm binding the devil, pleading the blood, calling Ghostbusters. Like, I just... There's something in me that just believes if something has died, it should remain dead, okay? And that is the idea today. I wanna to preach a message to you called Haunted by Hurt. Haunted by Hurt. And um, I, we're gonna read this passage, we're gonna pray, and I'm gonna let you sit down. First Samuel chapter 28, verse five. When King Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Then the king said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium. Now let me say, your translation may say who is a witch. Uh, so that I may go and inquire of her. And there is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes than the, king, than the royal robes he wore. And at night, he and two men went to this woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know that the king has done, he's cut off medium spiritualist witches from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Uh, Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom should I bring up for you? Bring up the old prophet Samuel, he said. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried to the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul, the king, said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a prophet's robe is coming up. Then, uh, then the king knew it was the old prophet Samuel. Um, I want us to pray and... I need you to pray and not just listen to me pray. Because in order for a doctor to perform surgery, he first has to have the patient sign a consent. And if you wanna experience the full measure of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life, he needs you to sign off on what he hopes to do today. And so, Father, we come to you right now and we just ask that whatever's in your heart would be done to us. That, Father, we believe you want better for us than we even want for ourselves. And so today, Lord, I'm asking humbly, would you turn this into an operating room? And would you heal? And would you cause broken hearts to be mended? And, Father, may you let people who have been living in death experience abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. You can take your seat. Um, you know, there are some passages of Scripture that are... Uh, inspirational, the type we hang on our refrigerators or put on the screen on our phone. Then there are some that are intellectual. They're the type that, you know, theologians debate and people in chat rooms go back and forth on. And then there are just some passages of scripture, frankly, that are plain weird. And this may be the weirdest. I mean, when you read this passage, I mean, we have to ask, what in the world is going on? We got a witch, we got a, a, a Ouija board, we got a king dressing like a common clothes. What is going on in this moment? I, I mean, in all honesty, what, what would cause a king to be so desperate that he would go to a witch? What would cause God's leader to go to such an ungodly place? What would cause a man who has been called to lead the people of God in the light of God to turn in desperation to the dark arts? Well, the, the answer to all of those questions is summed up in one word, and it's the word rejection. You see, a little context here. Saul is the first king of Israel, and when he was anointed king, the Lord decided in his wisdom to pair him with a godly prophet named Samuel. Samuel wasn't just a prophet, though. He was meant to work in tandem with the king. 
This older mentoring type man with this younger warrior were meant to walk step in step in God's will. The prophet hearing the voice of God, the king executing the directions from God. And for many years, this worked in perfect tandem and they were a wonderful partnership. But over time, Saul's heart began to turn away from the Lord and toward himself. He became arrogant, he became overconfident, and he started to go into battles God never called him to go into and started to walk out of battles he was never supposed to go into. Again and again, the old prophet would come to him, and in this fathering voice, he would pull him back into God's will, saying, this is not the way that you've been directed to go. But again and again, Saul's heart would betray him until one day he decided to overtly disobey the will of God when it came to a conflict with an enemy nation. And something about this time washed over the old prophet Samuel. A holy anger raised up in him and he walks into the camp of the Israelites and he doesn't ask for private audience with the king. Instead, he calls the king out in front of the entire army. And in front of the nation of Israel's army, he begins to let the king have it. He talks about his disobedience, he talks about his pride, and in an act of just anger, he literally rips the robes of the king and says, so is it from this day forward, the kingdom has been ripped from your hands. In this moment, this is a righteous cause, but it's said from the voice of a frustrated leader. And in this moment, not only are the robes of Saul ripped, but hearing his mentor's words, his heart is ripped with a wound of rejection. There's not a person here who doesn't understand what Saul felt that day. The truth is many of us, all of us, have at some point have experienced rejection. Some of you, it was when a teacher brought you up in front of the class and ridiculed your answer. For some, it's when a coach was harsh in unpacking your performance. For some of you, it was in a romantic relationship. You gave someone your heart and they gave it back to you in broken pieces. And then for many, it was in your own home, a brother, a sister, mother, most certainly a father, whose words in the moment they didn't measure and they went across your heart, wounding you in the same way that Saul was wounded. See, the question is not, um, have you been rejected? This is the question. Have you laid it to rest or are you still haunted by this hurt? Because what happens in this moment is that Saul Samuel has died, but the wound in Saul lives on. And, it, and, and like all human beings, when we let a wound go unhealed in our hearts, it begins to manifest itself in some dysfunctional ways. In, in Saul's life, you can see that this wound of rejection, maybe also in your life, pro- provided some very specific dysfunctions. First and foremost, because of this wound of rejection, Saul was incredibly insecure. The most insecure leader in all of scripture. Every room he walked into, he was crippled by the opinions of other people, constantly wondering if he measured up and if he was good enough to be where he was. Additionally, you can also see a great inconsistency in Saul's life. That that one day he wants to lead the kingdom and the next day he can't even get out of bed. That one day he wants to lead for God and then the next day he's building monuments to himself. So is it with some of us that one day you want to change the world and then other days you're tempted to leave the world because of an untreated wound of rejection. Additionally, Saul is also just inconsolable, meaning that he cannot find something that will soothe this pain. This conversation that happened wounded him and though the prophet has died, this wound continues to haunt him. He's tried substances to numb it. He's tried accomplishment to numb it. He's tried relationships to numb it. But no matter what he does, he cannot find peace. And so in a stressful moment with a battle looming, he decides, I'm going to a place, a dark place. I am going to go digging in the past to try to find peace in the present. And he packs up and he goes to this witch in Endor, hoping, believing that if I could talk To Samuel, he would say he didn't mean it. That if he could speak to him, he would would apologize for doing it. That, That somehow in my past pain, I can find peace for my present. He goes digging in an old grave. Now, this is where we start to no longer see ourselves in the story. We don't think, well, I've never went to a witch and a Ouija board to talk to somebody who offended me. But haven't you? I mean, you might not have went to a Ouija board, but I wonder how many times you've reread the texts. trying to see what you missed and which emoji you misinterpreted. I wonder how many times you've laid in bed and let those memories pour over again and again and thought, 
Why did he say that? Why did she do that? If I would have been more like this, if I would have said that, I wonder how many times you have retold the story, thinking that if this person agrees with you, someone who has nothing to do with it, that somehow it'll heal what's going on in you. You see, we're not that different from Saul. Many of us have found ourselves digging in the graves of our past memories, hoping to find peace in the present. But what we don't realize is, is that while we're digging in the past, we don't realize what it's doing to undo the present. First and foremost, I, I want you to know that you cannot be who God's called you to be. You can't walk in a God-given identity and actually live in insecurity from rejection. It is not lost on me in verse eight that the Bible says that before he could go to this dark place, Saul had to change clothes. He had to take off royalty so that he could wear rejection. And he goes into a place and takes off a crown God put on his head so that he can go into a place that God never called him to go. And I just wonder how many of us don't realize in 1 Peter 2 and 9, we've been called a holy people, a royal nation, a priesthood. But every time we take off our authority, we're putting on insecurity and we can't walk rejected and who God's called us to be at the exact same time. Additionally, Saul never realized that in this digging that there was danger. The Bible says that, in, um, that the old prophet does show up, but he doesn't show up with a message of peace and he doesn't show up with a message of kindness. Instead, he makes a pronouncement over Saul's life. He says, Saul, because you have done this, tomorrow you will join me in this grave. And the Bible says the next day Saul lost his life in battle and that very prophecy was fulfilled. You know what Saul didn't realize? Is when you're digging deep in a grave, there's often a hand that will pull you deeper in. You see, the Bible tells us um, that it's the prophet Samuel. But theologians have dug into this and here's what they, they've come to realize, that this is not actually the prophet. And it's because of this, think about this, what witch in Endor can reach into God's eternal security and just pull someone back into reality? Listen, when God's got somebody, he's got them and no witch can pull them back. Instead, this is an angel of light appearing like peace that actually has come as a spiritual enemy to speak lies into this life. Here's what I've learned over the years, that every place there's an untreated wound in the heart of a person, there's the voice of our spiritual enemy that he's there sowing in lies, speaking death, that as we're digging in the graves of our past, we don't realize he pulls us deeper and deeper and deeper until we don't realize that we're no longer digging in the grave, we're living in the grave. See, my concern for you is not that you'll actually die from rejection, it's that rejection will cause you from never living. It's hard to parent your kids standing in a grave. It's hard to build a business standing in a grave. It's hard to give God your all and fulfill your purpose living in a grave. And this is exactly what Saul found. He went to a dead place hoping to find life, but there's no life in dead places. Now, um, I, uh, I, I started pastoring in my early 20s, and um, looking back now, I just completed 10 years, and, and looking back now, I recognize that it was my spiritual enemy's plan that in my first two years, he would so wound me with rejection that either my heart would, I would just quit or my heart would get so hard that, that God couldn't use me. You realize that, that um, if your heart's hard, you can't, God can't use you. Because how, how can you represent a God of love if you can't love? And so the enemy sometimes will just keep wounding you so that you'll block everyone out because then you're just as disabled as though you weren't there to begin with. Well, I'll never forget that I got an email one day from one of our elders. He said he wanted to meet with me, and I didn't think anything of it. He invited him to my office, and he came in. I, I love this guy, and I, I believed he loved me. We sat down. We talked about the weather a little bit, and then the St. Louis Cardinals. And then finally, he said, well, Pastor, we just need to get to it. He said, I'm here today to tell you that me and my family are resigning all of our positions, and we're leaving the church. I was shocked. I said, what, what do you mean? I mean, you're one of our key leaders. I don't understand, what did someone do? We can fix it. And then he said, well, pastor, you can't fix this because the problem's you. He said, listen, you're a nice guy and all. And he said, I believe you got a good heart. But he said, you just don't have what it takes to lead me and my family spiritually. He said, well, we're gonna go down the road to a bigger, better, one everybody knows. And I think that's where we can grow. He said, I, 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 I pray for you, but he said, I, I just don't know. I'm just not sure that you're not in over your head with this. 
Well, in the, that moment, immediately, I, I was shocked because, I mean, this is, this is not somebody on the fringe. This is a leader. Additionally, I was angry because I was thinking about all the things I've done with this guy and partnered and thought we were together. But you know what? Honestly, that day, I was just sad because I already believed everything he said. And he was just confirming it for me that I didn't have what it takes. Now, what happened in that moment is very strange, something, something unique. He left my office, never walked in the building again. But for the next few months, I don't remember ever being in the building that he didn't sit right beside me. I don't, he never heard me preach again. But I don't ever remember a sermon that I wasn't preaching to him. I, I remember he didn't ever advise me again. But I remember every decision I could hear his voice. Somehow, some way, I was haunted by this hurt. And you can really tell that you're haunted by something when you, you, you go to do certain things in your mind naturally just goes back to that hurt. I don't know if you've ever had this happen. Have you ever been praying and you're praying about something specific but then your mind goes to a totally different situation? I remember praying over the church but my mind going back to that office. I remember praying over my family but my mind going back to that meeting. Again and again it would happen. And then one day in God's mercy, this went on for months, but one day in God's mercy, I remember praying and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit made an announcement in my heart. It's like he let me see what was going on and, and he, just, he just woke me up and all of a sudden with this phrase, son, if you don't let this die, it's not gonna let you live. And I quickly got a picture of me trying to lead a church while standing in a grave of me trying to walk out spiritual authority, but truthfully wearing insecurity. And all of a sudden, he showed me the condition of my heart and how it was haunting me, and he began to do a work in me that, got, that was so deep that it healed places in me I didn't even know it existed. Now listen, I, I know we don't know each other super well, but I'm here on this Sunday because the Holy Spirit sent me to announce the same healing he did in me, he's gonna be doing in this church today. That many of you who have been living in the graves of your past. We're not going to live there any longer. We're going to have a funeral today. It's tired. time to put away old hurts. It's time to put away what they said, what they did. No longer it will this dictate who you are and what you do. You will live according to the will of God, the direction of God, the purpose of God, and the spirit of God. Your dead things no longer are going to keep where you go. You're going to be led by the abundant life that God has for you, but you've got to heal. And so what I want to do today is I want to take you what it took me probably nearly a year to learn. And I'm going to teach you um, how Scripture teaches us to heal from wounds of rejection. Here's the first one. The first thing, if you want to heal from a wound of rejection, you've got to enter God's presence. You know, one Sunday I was, I was speaking at another church and I was driving home and I got, a, I, I got kind of hungry, like a craving for God's chicken, you know, Chick-fil-A. Are you, is anybody else like me? I only want Chick-fil-A on Sundays. It's the only day I want it, but it, of course they're not open. But, so I went to this other chicken restaurant and I won't say, just in case by chance your uncle started it, I won't say what it is. You know, it is a place that, that, that the sign says chicken, the advertisements say chicken, the menu says chicken. And I walked in that day and I, I looked, there's a little girl behind the counter and she said, what can I get you? I said, I'll take a number one, a chicken sandwich. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any chicken. I said, what do you mean you don't have any chicken? She said, yeah, we've had some shipment issues. We said, we do have a fish sandwich though, if you wanna try that. Now in this moment, what I experienced is what every one of us have experienced, which is the idea that, that something is advertised, that if we experience it, that if we have it, it will deliver what we've desired only to buy it and find out that it cannot deliver on what it says it can. You see, culture says when you're wounded on the inside, sex can heal. It says that substances can heal. It says that if you get enough accomplished and you become well known enough that you can be healed from the things that have happened to you. But guess what? We've all bought that and they don't have any chicken. If your soul is unwell, there's only one place you go and that's to the one who created your soul. Joy is found in his presence. Heaviness is lifted in his presence. It's in his presence that we discover he has all we need and it's what we've been looking for. Our heart 
hearts are too complicated for us to unravel. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit to unravel and show us what is going on on the inside of us. It's when you step into his presence that you realize this is what I've been looking for because your soul, no matter what you think, it's God starved, God hungry, God searching. You can meet some interesting people. You can go to some beautiful places. You can accomplish some wonderful things, but your soul will not be satisfied because it is longing for the one who created it. And if your soul's unwell, it won't be well until you get in God's presence. And this is the issue for many of us. We've went to counseling and counseling's wonderful. We've taken a prescription and that's terrific. But the problem is it starts with God's presence. I can show it to you in scripture, uh, Psalm 28, seven, the Lord is my strength and my shield. Look at this, in him my heart trusts. You see, for many of us, our hearts haven't been opened and that's why what we're trying isn't working. In him. Now, here's what, what I've learned though. Um, for most people, we don't recognize how to enter his presence. You see, God's omnipresent, which means he's present everywhere at all times. You've never not been anywhere God's not. But being in God's presence and entering God's presence are two totally different things. That's the reason that two people can come to Byron, sit on the same row with the same issue. One person can leave with their issue and the other person can leave completely free. Both were in his presence, but one entered his presence. You see, we enter God's presence through one thing, worship. You see, you thought we just sang all those songs just to fill time. No, 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 no. We sang those songs because the word of God is no good on a closed heart. We worship to open to the work of God. Now, the problem is, is when you're wounded, you don't wanna worship. And that's why it's called a sacrifice of praise. It's not called the recliner of praise. The Holy Spirit um, reminded me that Jesus said he likes to be worshiped four ways, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, four ways. Most of us only worship the way we're comfortable with. And as I was praying for you today, here's what I sensed the Lord saying, that you need to express an uncomfortable worship so that you can give fresh access to your heart to God. You know what that means? That means some of you need to raise your hands for the first time. I know you feel goofy when you do it, but do it anyways, because the Bible says it. I know some of you need to sing, and you say, I'm not a singer, it doesn't matter. God loves your voice, he gave it to you, and you need to open your mouth and sing for the first time. Some of you need to cry, because sometimes tears are worship. And as you express a fresh worship, your heart opens to a new way of God's work. Here's the second one. Um, you have to then unmask and admit that you're hurt. I had a friend of mine said, man, it's too bad Pastor Ethan didn't have you in a couple weeks. This would be a great Halloween message. I said, I'm not worried about it. Church people wear masks every week. <laughs> Don't act like y'all are indifferent. <laughs> Listen, I know you were on your way here. You and your husband fought the whole way. And the minute you walked in, someone said, how y'all doing? Oh, we're in love, blessed, highly favored, good to be here. You were doing that thing with your kid where you're trying to hit them and drive at the same time, and then you put them in kids' ministry like they're just a little angel. <laughs> Listen, at some point, if you wanna heal, you have to take the mask. Isn't it interesting that Saul died, but Saul came in a costume? You see, um, and, and, and I don't, I don't want to be trivial. Some of us don't even know how to take the mask off. And it's because in here is so complicated. We're talking about it out here because it's logical, but in here it's not logical. Let, let me say it this way. In our house, we have a basket of single socks. Now, I, it, two socks went into the washer, and, I, and, and somewhere between the washer and the dryer, there's a portal to another dimension, and one of them socks is gone. And so what I have is something without a match. Listen, some of you, because you just move forward, you pressed on, you don't recognize that the event that happened started an emotion you still have. And some of you are walking around with anger going, when did this start? I don't remember, when, when would I start being angry? Some of you are walking around, I've never been anxious, but I have panic attacks all the time. Some of you are walking around holding up an emotion and you forgot the event it was connected to. And in order, in order to heal, you gotta take that emotion and tie it back to the event. Yeah. What they said, when they did it. Because forgiveness is exact in scripture. It's not, we can't generally forgive. We have to forgive something specific. Now, now let me say this. You're not gonna figure this out by yourself. You're not just gonna think your way into what the problem is. Listen, that's why you need to sit down with someone and take off the mask. 
I can't say this about every church, but this church is true. When you sit down with somebody on this team, these pastors, they're confidential, they're empathetic, and they're there because they love you. And as you begin to talk, the Holy Spirit will use their questions and their insights to help you go, oh, that's where that anger started. With my dad all those years ago. Oh, that's where the fear came in. Is when I was dumped in all that, that, that grade. You see, the reality is until you can acknowledge what happened, you can't heal from it. And I, I know, that, I know that's, that's tough, but listen, I just want you to know as a pastor, when someone comes to me and says, I'm about to tell you something I've never told anyone else, I don't go. I, I get excited because I know grace is about to come in. I know light's about to invade darkness. I know somebody's about to get free because if you got enough courage to be honest, God's got enough power to heal but you're gonna have to unmask it. Now, here's the third one. Once you know what it is, you have to release the pain. We have five kids, and, and so that means we've had every bump and bruise possible, and um, it's, it's not uncommon for one of them to get hurt and come to me and go, oh, daddy, it hurts, hurts, hurts. Fix it, fix it, fix it. And then when I go to touch it, they, no, 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 don't touch it. So they come to the right person, but they don't release the pain. I wonder how many people come here week after week. They come to the right place but they leave with the same pain. And it's because we wouldn't release our pain to, to, unless we trusted someone could appreciate it. I mean, pain's too precious. I'm not just gonna give it to anybody. I mean, the fact is, is now I lived through that divorce. I went through that season. I was abused and I can't just get, listen, if I don't trust you, I'm not gonna get, it's like surgery. I'm not gonna lay on a table. I had a guy one time tell me, you know, with five kids, the topic of a vasectomy has come up many times. And, and I had a guy tell me one time, he said, hey, if you decide to do that, I know someone who can do one cheap. No thank you on the clearance rack vasectomy. I'll be going to the Mayo Clinic, the Harvard certified surgeon. I'm not getting on the table unless I trust the individual. I'm not looking at Pastor Ethan after that joke. Listen, your pastor loves you, but he can't take your pain. And your friends love you, but they can't take your pain. I wrote a book on hurt and I can't take your pain. There is only one. Jesus Christ was the most rejected individual to ever walk the face of this earth. His earthly father rejected him before he was even born. The king who was over his province had every boy his age murdered because he so rejected his leadership. Every teacher he ever had insulted him. And in his hometown, they said that he should be committed. People that were his friends, he grew up around. His neighbors tried to throw him off a cliff in Nazareth. His brothers and sisters said that he's a lunatic. Those closest to him all rejected him in his hour of greatest need. They, the Romans rejected him, the Greeks rejected him, the Jews rejected him. Two thieves rejected him as soldiers mocked him. And if that wasn't enough, his heavenly father, because of bearing our sin, turned his back on him. I wrote this in my journal one day. If you're looking for someone educated in pain, it's Jesus. He studied criticism at every level. He traveled abroad, enduring false accusation. His undergrad is in betrayal. He minored in discrimination. He majored in injustice. His graduate degree is in humiliation with a specialty in heartbreak. But you know what's interesting is he's not just educated to pain, he knows your pain. The Bible said he heard every word, he was present for every act. And sometimes we hold on to our pain because we think if we let it go, they get off the hook. But I want to tell you today, God's just. When a crime's committed, a detective comes in and goes through a tedious process to collect the evidence so that the evidence being preserved in a court of law, justice can be served. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 56, 8, that God collected every one of your tears. That's not just for trophy, it's evidence. He's the eyewitness and he has proof of what they did so that the court of heaven can execute justice on that person, so that you don't have to carry the pain. You can release the pain, receive his peace, because he's trustworthy to carry it. Here's what releasing your pain to Jesus means. You stop going anywhere else for comfort. Every time the pain comes, you don't go to the bottle. The memories come back, you don't text them to come over. 
Every time that you, you, you sense that, that, that trigger, you don't go shopping. You don't go, you don't go buy another thing. Whatever you're doing right now to comfort yourself, you get rid of it and you only go to Christ for the comfort. That's what releasing the pain looks like. Here's the last one. Now, that, that, what's interesting is that seems like a good altar call. But that's why most people don't heal from rejection. They only go through three steps of the four. The fourth step is you have to receive God's blessing. You see, releasing the pain is how you get out of the grave. Receiving God's blessing is how we cover the grave so you never return. Consider this, that Saul um, lived this way his entire life. But the first page of scripture that Saul appears on, 1 Samuel chapter 10, the Bible says that when he was anointed king, the Holy Spirit declared a thing over Saul's life. Here's what it declared. From this day forward, you will be different. From this day on, you will have gifts that have been given by me. Go and do what is ever in your heart. I'm with you, says the Lord. Now, listen, that's before he ever won a battle, ever made a decree. From the beginning, God said, you're mine, and I love you, and I'm with you. Imagine if Saul would have dug in his memory to that moment instead of in the pain of his past. That's the tragedy of Saul. He spent his whole life looking for something he had from day one. And I wonder how many of us are living trying to find ultimate approval because of a wound of rejection and we don't realize that we've had it from day one. And I know some of you, because of your pain, you've done some ugly things. Pain's caused you to hurt other people. Pain's caused you to to act in really ungodly ways and you think, yeah, I just, I think I've made a real mess of this whole pain thing. A good friend of mine is named Scott. His dad's name's Robert. He told me this story when Scott was in high school. He was uh, a junior and he was playing baseball, a double header against his county rival. It was a big deal to a kid in junior in high school. And they, 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 the, game, the first game went back and forth, back and forth until it came to the bottom of the ninth. Scott's team was down by one run and uh, they, they had two outs. They had a person on base and Scott comes up to the plate, meaning he had a chance to win this game. He walks up and um, the crowd in this little baseball auditorium hushes and then all of a sudden, um, this pitcher rears back and releases a mighty fastball. Scott takes a big swing and it connects and Scott hits every little boy's dream, the game-winning home run over his county rival. Scott said it was deafening the cheers from the crowd. He said to watch the other team drop their head and defeat just felt so satisfying. He went around the bases and before he even got to home, his team picked him up and carried him off the field. He said it's by far one of the best days of my entire life. They had a period of time in between the next game and then the next game started. Scott still feeling the adrenaline from the first game. Now this game, like the first, was a close one, back and forth and back and forth. And strangely enough, it came down to the bottom of the ninth again, and his county rival was up by two runs this time, but there were two people on base, and sure enough, with two outs, can you guess who came up again? Scott. Same situation. Well, this time he walks up with great confidence. I mean, I've already done this one time. The crowd stands to their feet knowing he's already done this one time. And um, so Scott goes up, pitcher lines up, rears back, releases a fastball. Scott can't get around on it this time. He lets it pass, strike one. Next pitch, curveball. Scott takes a mighty swing, but it's a foul ball, strike two. Now it's very tense. You could feel everybody you know, on the edge of their seat, standing, waiting for this moment. Pitcher rears back, releases a pitch. Scott judges that it's outside. Thought it was a ball until he heard the umpire say, Steve, right? Three, ball game. It had caught the outside of the plate. All of a sudden, there were no cheers. It was just a groan that waved across the whole baseball stadium. The other team celebrating at Scott's expense, and he could hear some of his teammates say, why didn't he swing? In a 16, 17-year-old's mind, he has literally just let down the entire world. He drops his head, still standing at the plate. Nobody comes to greet him. A couple moments pass, and then all of a sudden, he hears something over his right shoulder, looks back, and hears in the stands, while other people are packing up, that's my boy! That's my boy! He looks back and sees his dad cheering to the top of his lungs, letting everyone know that the one who just struck out was his. Robert comes down on the field, tears are welling up in Scott's eyes, he puts his arm around Scott, and he says, son, 
never forget, a strikeout will not change the fact you're mine. And I know some of you feel like such a mess. And what was done to you wasn't fair, but what you've done as a result of that pain is... It just makes you feel so much shame. But if you could hear over the balcony of heaven today, you would hear your heavenly father to the host of heaven saying, see that one going through the divorce? She's my daughter. See the one right there that just went bankrupt? That's my son. See the one carrying that addiction? That's my boy. Because you're present is not the totality of who you are. Your father sees you in what you're gonna become. He sees you in the way you created you. And though you are disappointed with yourself, he is not disappointed with you. You are not broken to him. You are his beloved and you can do anything you want, but you can't get him to stop loving you. He's loved you completely and fully and eternally. And if you'll get that in your heart, what does it matter what the person did to you? I want you to stand to your feet today. And I want us to have a moment where we would pray and release our pain. I sense in prayer today that there are some high schoolers in this room who you feel so rejected about what a group of friends did to you last semester. You've hated every week of this year because of it. I sense that there were some, some women who though you are a mother, some of your grandmothers, you're still trying to please your mother you so hard there's some men in here who you you live with a lot of rejection because um, someone that was over you in your career never saw the potential you know you were made for more but they kept giving other opportunities to other people you're living with wounds of rejection and so what I want to do is I, I if, if, if you just be honest enough brave enough to kind of admit that I want you to take your hands just balled up like this just like this so whatever that is, the divorce, the pain, the abuse, the, the whatever that is. And when I tell you, I want you to release it by faith, saying, God, it's yours now, and I want to receive your blessing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray a work of God, something that cannot be done in human strength or ingenuity, something that is so much more than intellectual understanding, but that goes to the depths. Lord, your word says your spirit judges the heart, searches the hearts of men. And so I'm asking in this moment, oh God, as I sense the compassion of Jesus, may you heal people as they release this pain to you. Come on, open your hands and just release it. It's just a step of faith right now. Father, we release the mother wounds and the father wounds. We release the, the ex. We release, God, the, the, the friends who weren't friends and the betrayal, the gossip. We release the people who overlooked and we release, God, the situation that so scarred our hearts. We release it to you. And we receive your forgiveness and your healing and the ministry of the Lord Jesus today. And Father, my prayer is this, that deeper than their mind, in their heart, their spirit, the love of God be pronounced. May they be an undeniable recognition they are yours, that you celebrate them, you bless them, that God, you are with them and that they should go and do what is ever in their heart for Lord, you are with them in every way. Nothing they've done, nothing they've thought, nothing they can do, nothing they've said. God, whatever cause your love to waver, they are eternally, completely, absolutely loved by their heavenly Father. And from that, a fresh confidence. And from that, a fresh joy. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, if you receive that today by faith, come on, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
Come on, you're going to walk out of here free today. No longer bound by what has happened. No longer stuck in a place where you're digging up bones. Come on. I was thinking of Pastor Randy Travis while he was preaching. Resurrecting memories of a love that's dead and gone. Today, walk out of here free and, and find that freedom and grace in Jesus' name. You believe it today? give someone the opportunity, it could just be one, to surrender their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you today, He loves you, He cares for you, He died for you, and He doesn't want you to walk out of this room. The Bible teaches us that it is His will that all men be saved, that everyone everywhere that would repent and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this message spoke to you, but can I tell you, this message means nothing if you don't know Jesus. If you don't give your life fully and to surrender today, say, I'm done running. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean with your blood. Make me new today. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, in this church said, amen. Come on, give God a big praise this morning. Listen, before you go, if you're one of the people that you prayed that prayer from your heart saying, you know what, Jesus, I want to be a new creature in Christ. I want you to do me a favor and text the number 40497 just so we don't lose track of you. Let us know that you're in the family of God and we want to be the first to welcome you. Welcome to the family of God. Amen, everybody.